up nicely. This is the Drew and Fuse Show. The Drew and Fuse Show. The Drew and Fuse Show. Yeah, they clean up nicely. Hey, hey, party people, Daft Punks. You know, we're back. It's another episode. Um, before we forget, we just want to tell you guys that uh, check out the new Crate Hackers. It's not out yet, so you can't really check it out. But <laughs> what, what you can check out is the banger button. We did. We were fucking with that the other day. We were. It's still beta, but it does come up with some results. Again, it's not going to change your life in that it's the end all be all. But if you just have it up there and you just. You know, throw hit the button every now and then just for uh, some ideas. Some uh, it does have ideas. It does. I need to use it during my set, not just like fuck around with it at home. Um, just to like, I think sometimes DJs are just haters by nature, and uh, you know they want to hate like on anything that's like a tool. But if you use it for a tool, I think it could be really cool. Um, <clears throat> Definitely. Uh... I'm with you. I want to see it. I need to try it live because Same. I think, you know, we're playing a lot of remixes and other stuff. I wonder how much it like actually picks that up and right. can, it can be like, Oh, play this, you know? Right. Is it grabbing the vocals? Is it grabbing the, the, you know, the instrumental, like what's it really feeding off of? But we, we were getting lots of positive results. Me and Fuse tried it. Yeah. We, bunch, you know, so we were getting a lot of positive results. And uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, I think people should check it out. I, I also think if you're listening to this episode of the podcast, last week we would all have done um, another live Crate Hackers hackathon. Drew and I are on there once a month. We will have discussed um, basically one of the things that we want to do is we try to come up with a new theme all the time when we do these once a month things. And, uh, you know, last month we did um, where we went through people's Serato histories and basically cr critiqued them. And then this this one, this past week, we will have done uh, where the listeners pick a song and Drew and I say essentially what we would play before and after. Now, granted, that could be a little situational, but, um, you know, it's just an idea. It'll probably but, end up coming out. If you're listening to this now, Drew will probably have said, delete most of the songs that you're asking me about. And then it'll all be a salt. <laughs> yeah. So maybe maybe redo the whole library. I don't know. Uh, and if you need to redo the whole library, what better place to go to than directmusicservice.com, where if you yes. use the promo code Drew and Fuse Show, it'll get you 30% off your first month. That's right, first month only. Don't be messaging me being like, yo, I listened to the promo, and then I thought I got 30% off every month. Nope, it's first month only. <laughs> there it is. Mm -hmm. Lots of good stuff on there. What else you got before we get started with today's guest? I'm just... Pump for today's guest. I, I, yeah, I have, uh, I know there's some stories in there and I'm, I'm, I'm waiting for the stories. So I want to okay. hear some stuff. So, I'm all right. All right. Well, let's, let's get into it. We won't waste too much time. Uh, today's guest has been holding down residencies from New York City to Shanghai, China. She's played alongside big DJs such as Qbert, A Track, Kill the Noise, Travis Barker, Cypress Hill. She's toured with, West Coast legend DJ Quick, and she was Lady Sovereign's tour DJ. Uh, she's been endorsed by Pioneer at Rain, uh, Novation, been nominated in the DJ Times as America's Best DJ. Please help us welcome DJ Analyze. Hey. Hey. <laughs> Some major achievements there. Thank you. Thank you. It's been, it's been a long time short road <laughs> that's how i feel most of the time like uh i was out and about the other day and somebody was bringing up something I have no idea what it was but i was going oh fuck i for totally forgot that it, that even happened you know yeah. um these these times go by and i wish uh when we all got started we we had our cell phones or any kind of something to remember half of the shit that we did you know I don't know. I was never good with a camera, so it always, you know, I feel like I, I lost good. out on so much stuff. 
I was going through an old hard drive yesterday and I found some pictures of what last time I was in Shanghai. And yeah, that was, it was before iPhones. So it's like, it's kind of wild to look at, you know, actual photos, um, you know, still, I mean, with like the, you know, digital camera, but still the quality yeah. back in like 2009 versus like now, <laughs> you know, that, like that. I, just, I have pictures of me doing everything except DJ. I'm like, <laughs> this is all like all of it. So, which, which, okay. So by the way, those cameras are coming back. So I bought my daughter uh, a little uh, picture camera, like one of the ones I had back in the days. And mm -hmm. all the kids are are trying to take old photos now. That's the, the hip thing. So what I'm saying is if you were to put them up, it will look uh, on brand for today's era. What, what was the question? Any, any, no, no, I'm not a question. I'm telling oh, you, like, oh. any old photos from like Shanghai oh, or any of that stuff will look on brand from like like today's era is like wanting those old throwback pictures. Yeah, is, like, the hip look. is super hip. So oh, it, yeah. it, it, it'll be a good look. Like, They'll it be like, was this three old. days ago? Uh, yeah. <laughs> right. Like a lot of the uh, influencers now are buying like the, the old Kodak. Yep. Disposables. That's like a thing now too. And then they take them and develop them and use that almost as like a filter. And then they yeah. for that and upload that. I, I bought my daughter like an old ass camera and she was so hyped on it. I'm going, you have this cell phone that you, you know, I guess with the camera, she takes less selfies. It's more of like actual things. <laughs> but right. anyways, I, I think it would relate is what I'm getting at. It's, it's yeah. Uh, you know, yeah. Yeah, it was funny because, you know, back then it was like people taking photos with like headphones and, you know, uh, with your Serato box. And like, you remember those really bad old photos? Oh, yeah. Why? <laughs> Definitely. Mm -hmm. I saw one at one point. I, I think that's where I, I had to draw the line is that he was like sliding down a slide with his like like controller or a record. I'm going, okay, bro. Like, like maybe, maybe we've hit the wall on this one. That is too funny. So you want to you want to jump into some of these uh, rapid fires? We'll just loosen up a little bit. Let's do it. All right, we got one of these great segment videos. This is one of the old ones because I haven't swapped it out. <laughs> Now time for rapid fire. Anyway, so some rapid fire questions, um, and these are some of them are simple, and some of them can be a little more lengthy if they if they go that way. Do you use Serato or Record Box? Serato. Headphones or no headphones? Headphones. Uh, favorite genre to listen to? Probably uh, dancehall. Okay. I agree. Uh, favorite genre to dj probably dance huh? <laughs> okay i mean that's tough that's a loaded question that's like, i like yeah. to play i like to yeah, play yeah yeah it's yeah. tough are you running are you running the uh, a full rhythm are you like going back to forth on all of them or it depends on the crowd if i can tell they're like into it i'll run a few rhythms but if i can tell yeah. them i'm gonna switch into something they might know right 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 okay. This is a this is a question that'll get a little more lengthy. But where do you see the future of DJing? I'll 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 lead this up for you. We were at we saw you at Nam, and I don't know how long you've been going to Nam. I've been going for a while, and I feel like the evolution it was turntables, and then it went heavily controllers, and now we're back to turntables, right? And mm -hmm. you had a whole scratch battle and a whole scratch. There was one at Pioneer, and there was another one at the Techniques thing that you did. I feel like it's coming back to like actually performance and it's, you know, that's where I'm at with it. Uh, so I, we're just curious. Do you see it like where you see it going? Yeah. Uh, so I've also, I've been doing NAM since 2002. So I've, I'm quite, quite the veteran in that. Yeah. Well, um, yeah, it's weird. Cause I see both extremes right now. Like I see the controllerism and like everybody going more digital, smaller controllers. You know, the algorithm stuff getting really big, all that. But then, have you tried that yet? I haven't, and I really want to. Oh, I want to too. Uh, I met one of the girls from their company, one of their reps, and she's like, Yeah, we'll send you everything. And just reminded me that I got to follow up with that. But I've, I've heard nothing but great things from a lot of like reputable, reputable DJs. 
Yeah, the fact that the the timeline or what is it, um, the grid, the fact that the grid like adjusts itself just is what's kind of intrigues me because, you know, Serato, you have to get there and you have to really dial in everything. Yeah. So if there's like a transition or anything, it fucks it up. But the fact that it stays really on, I don't use Q, um, Sync, yeah. but if I did, like I feel like it, it would really like help it. Yeah, from what I've heard from some of the techs and people I know that have like worked on worked on it like what i was what i heard was that um it's just newer software so there's not as much like i know with like the older serato and tractor and all those ones they've had to kind of go back fix this add this whereas like this one is just like a clean slate from like the beginning kind of thing is what i've heard like it's it's like newer technology yeah I think that would be the word because i was talking to yeah. one of the guys that actually helped um he was one of the developers of final scratch back in the day oh, wow yeah. He was telling me, he's like, dude, this is like, it's it's really, really dope. So ever since then, I've wanted to try it, but I just haven't had a chance to get my hands on it. I like that I would be able to use my phone as a backup versus carrying around multiple laptops. I mean, for important gigs, you know? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I see both extremes, though. Like I said, you see very, very digital, but then you see a lot of, like, right now, two vinyl sales are at, like, an all-time high since, like, 1999 or 2001 or something like that. So I, I do see a lot more and like I, I get hit up like God once a week or every other week asking if I know somebody that can do an all vinyl set in which Steve Dub always is the go to for that. Yeah, um, always. <laughs> always. I'm like, well, I got one guy. I, yeah, I, I see both extremes right now. So I don't really know what, what the future holds. What about in terms of, of music? I feel like. Drew and I, you know, we talk every week with people and just, I like hearing everybody's different take on where, where they think the direction of music is going. Uh, that's a tough one. <laughs> I think yeah. like, uh, it's, I feel like music's just in a really weird spot right now because everything is so accessible and so available that like there's no shelf life in songs like there used to be, you know, it was like the radio terrestrial, like radio, like dictated what we listened to before so we just knew what songs to play but now you're like in everybody's bag so it's like you know you got this girl on you know her spotify playlist has like these songs and then someone else who has something else and that's that's what they know they're not like listening to the radio so it's it's just a little bit um it's just a bit more it's tougher i think in that sense because you're trying to please people and like you have absolutely no idea what they listen to whereas like before it was like here's the top like 50 songs and kind of just mix them right why right. like when even when i listen to like you know i go to you know club killers or any podcast and i listen to like a mix it's still the same songs from like 2010 to 2015 you know right yeah. the newer version of uh chris uh chris brown forever you know like how can we mix it better <laughs> yeah and it's just the same like how many times are we gonna have calabria like or right. yeah like uh like redone and um you know like all those all those songs like that have just been like beaten to death, you know? Right. Just still getting redone and redone and redone, you know, classics. Yeah. It's one, it's, I find it interesting. Like I was just talking to even Steve last night, we were texting back and forth and like, He's it's, dope. He, it's, it's where like in 10 years will like concisive hits as we know it be gone completely to like, where it's like open format DJing won't even be open format DJing as we know it now, like we'll be more, you know, like themed parties and like, will nights, you know, be more like, Oh, we only play this genre here, you know, cause it, how, when, when there's less and less concisive hits that come out, like you're kind of mentioning about like a radio hit, you know, how do you play to a room full of people that are just all just there without okay. being there for something specific? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's tough. Like even, even that new Nicki Minaj that everybody when that drop in December, November, December, and it's already right. now people are like, they don't, you know, everything gets burns out so quick by reels on top of it. Right. And right. So that it's like, by the time they hear it in the club, they've already played it out on their Spotify and everything. And it's like, once you can play the original and it still hits. <laughs> right. So it's, it's, it's wild right now where, where music is at, you know, mm -hmm. yeah. Maybe, I think the theme party thing is something that you will definitely probably see because I can't imagine a lot of these songs making it even to the end of this year, you know? Right. Yeah. I also think it's interesting, like, you and Drew do the bungalow spot. I think more, like, loungy places could be 
popping up left and right where it's like people don't come to like dance and party it's more just like they come for the the vibe that that's created you know and i think that could be more of a thing that takes over and with djing and stuff yeah i've noticed that that since i moved out here because like i'm from the east coast i'm from new york and right. um and then I, I lived in chicago for a bit and i was in toronto for a while and i did all bottle service clubs for the last you know probably 16 17 years um and now out here i do all like chill lounge events which is crazy to not <laughs> <laughs> to not have like, a music director in your ear or somebody being like, come on, bottles. Like they, they want right. to play it, you know, now. Um, yeah. So it's wild because like Drew and I have spoke about like, we're so used to playing like lounge stuff now that like when people actually dance now, you're just like, wait, <laughs> you know, like oh my God. Like, cause I'm, I'm just uh, not I'm so used to doing vibey spots now and like a lot of corporate events where you're just kind of background music. Right. No, obviously you still got it in me and I can still crush it, you know? Right. But, uh, right. But at that venue, when they start dancing, I get anxiety. I'm like, no, 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 sit down. No, no, no. I was in my spot. I was yeah, in my zone. Yeah. Don't <laughs> fuck up my zone. Jay, I agree about that, too, because we, we had played some other, one of the pools, I forget which one it was, and we were saying the same thing, like, about that. Yeah. It's similar, because like, you get so used to those vibey spots that when right. people start dancing there, you're almost like, wait, wait, what? Like, that. Yeah. And, and, and I always get a lot of compliments at the vibey spots and they're like, oh, the music's so good. I'm, I'm going, well, it's because you're not telling me what the fuck to do. Like, you're just letting me do me, you know? Okay. Uh, right. But once everyone starts dancing, like those compliments, like not that they like, you know, everyone's like hate, hating what I'm doing, but it's not as like, um, just like, oh man, it's just so amazing. You know, it's just such a vibe. Right. It's, it's also, like I said, where I, I came from, where you just bang hits and you don't play yeah. filler music. Like, even if you played a filler song, like my music director would be looking at me like, what's wrong with you? You know what I mean? Like keep them on the floor. Yeah. So when you come out here and it's funny because I speak with like a lot of the DJs out here and it's, they're playing like, you know, a lot of filler music and not, not just bang yeah. hits. And it's, it was a totally different style of DJing that I was ever, you know, used to. And now you know, like, people are like into like that whole vibey part of it you know and right. they're, they appreciate it right and and weed's not weed is legal here but it's not really like the places that we're playing so what happens once vegas and la like actually introduces the weed into it right right uh, that could even take it into a whole new fucking era right 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 beanbag chairs and vibes <laughs> hey there's that's our next sunday party beanbag chairs and vibes <laughs> it's funny though because drew and i were talking about this this morning on the phone like right now the two spots that i do every weekend are just pretty much like dance floor kind of places and it's very driven by like people dancing and it is very i feel like for me it's like draining a lot to like go do that every weekend because when you miss with like a song or you try to take a chance sometimes it can fuck everything up and I, I very much miss getting to play sets right now where it's like I can, I can take a little more chances or just kind of create the vibe. So having that balance of getting to do both is nice. But then at the same time, when you're doing the like vibey gigs too much, where you're like, I just I'm over it. I'm over playing background music for people. Yeah. <laughs> you could throw a mix on in a lot of those places and they wouldn't even know there was a DJ there. Right. You know what I mean? Like people yeah. don't. Bungalow, totally different story. People know there and people appreciate it. But some of the other spots I've done, it's like, it's whatever. Right. But I do, right. I do miss the energy. You know, I miss like the crazy club and people just like losing their mind over songs and like, you know, the energy right. and the dance floor and all that. That's a whole different style of DJing, you know? And mm -hmm. that's like our that's our reward, I think, as DJ. Right. We, we right. vibe with that. That's the shit that, you know, 25 years later, I'm still like, that's better than the paycheck, you know? Right. Yep. Totally agree. Earlier, we mentioned that you you, you uh, traveled with and toured with uh, DJ Quick. And then why don't you tell us a little bit about that and then how you kind of moved from that to being with Lady Sovereign. Okay. So in May of 2006, um, I believe this was still the MySpace days. Like I got somebody that had hit me up and was like, um, you know, DJ Quick is looking for a tour DJ. And I didn't even know who DJ Quick was. I'm from the East Coast. Like he's a West right. Coast, you know, but on the East Coast, like I didn't grow up with Quick. Um, 
Anyways, I was like, I'll do it. Didn't know any of his music, nothing. And they put, me in touch. they put me in touch with like, and it, there was no like Spotify back then. I don't even know if there was YouTube back then. Was there? There might have been. Mm, um, not YouTube, YouTube like we know it now. No, it was, no. like, I would listen to a full album. Like I would have no. like, bought it, either yeah. bought the actual album or I don't even know if iTunes existed back then, did it? Yeah, iTunes was definitely around. YouTube yeah. would have been early era, like you said. It, it was definitely there, but it wasn't like yeah. it was random cat videos, and it's like what TikTok is basically yeah. now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so uh, the the guy that put me in touch with Quick, he was just like, "Here you go." Did all that. They flew me out the next day, literally the next day. I didn't have any time to prep or get ready. I was on a flight, got to LA. We went to the studio to go like um, go through some of the music and stuff, which we didn't do any of that. They just sat there and <laughs> chilled. <laughs> and we drank Hennessy and we chilled. And uh, <laughs> I was pretty drunk that night, that's for sure. We went to like some clothing store and we picked out a bunch of really dope clothes that they were like sponsoring us. And then um, I was on a tour bus and we just went on tour. I still at this point didn't know any of the music. I knew nothing. So I kind of went into it pretty blind. And I just learned on the road as we went through it. They just like handed me back then. Um, it was an instant replay machine is what they used to use. Right. Yeah. And they just handed it to me and they were like, here you go, play some songs. And I was like, I don't know what songs. I was like guessing every night. I was like, safe and sound. That sounds good. You know, <laughs> so I didn't know what the hits or anything. There was no set list, any of that. So um, like I said, this is. Was- this is early Serato, so they they still weren't just like giving you that to, to you would just scratch over the the relay machine. Uh, I was still on Final Scratch then when it was okay. tracked. Yeah, yeah. I, I was in a contract with them, so I uh, I couldn't have Serato then. <laughs> so so, I'm sorry we're jumping around, but okay. you're heavily into brands and. You um you got on Final Scratch was like that's one of your your brands that you were pushing or sponsored yeah. by yeah and how to to go a little bit back how did that go about just how did they find you in that era right pre it's just only MySpace right it's not pre like pre major social media yeah it was the Nam show so I had oh, went to okay Nam in two thousand. Two, I believe. I went to NAMM in 2002 with Behringer. They found me back in the day too through like this email. They were like, Behringer's looking for a female DJ that can scratch. I was, it was called like Sister DJs, a female DJ that could scratch. So I replied and I sent them one of my mixes and they really liked it. So they, they flew me out to Seattle and I kind of did like this. And this was 02. I was doing like kind of mashup stuff back then. I remember playing, um, bringing a bunch of vinyl with me because I was still, yeah, this was still the days of vinyl. 2002, very early. Like, yeah. not, I don't even think Final Scratch was really a thing. It wasn't even, it came out yeah. that year that I okay. got started. But anyways, I went to the Behringer office, did a set for them. I remember I was like mixing like Pink Floyd with like, you know, rock music mixed with like hip hop just to kind of show them like I could play a little bit of everything. Yeah. And then, um, yeah, they flew me to the NAMM show. I got there and I was doing like a demo of their mixer and I had met Shorty and that was the year that she had just dropped like this scratch or like this like tutorial DVD. And I worked at a record store at the time. And I remember thinking like I was this dope DJ. And then I remember her, her like DVD coming out and me being like, Oh yeah, let me watch this. And then I watched it and I was like, Oh my God, this girl's like really dope. Like I'm back, you know? Yeah. So anyway, so fast forward to the NAM show and I see her walking around and I'm just like, oh my God, that's the girl from the video. Like, holy shit. So I go yeah. up to her and I start talking to her and I tell her, uh, oh my God, like, I love your video. I learned how to do a couple scratches from it. And she was like, she was at the Stanton booth. And so she introduced me to the Stanton people. The next year at NAM, she, they got me signed with them, basically. Like, and so then I was yeah. dead out. All the stat and gear, they sent me a ton of gear and they sent me Final Scratch. Right. So that's how right. I got in with Final Scratch in like, like I said, like 2002. Um, so, so, so we had Zimmy on uh, one of the last episodes and he was 
talking about we were talking about all the DJs coming through the Pioneer booth and basically setting up their their camera and going like, oh look at me, like ba ba ba, thinking they're gonna get signed. It actually fucking happened to you. This is how funny this like all comes around is yeah. you know, nowadays these guys show up, their cameras are trying to do the thing and the bit, and everything that they think is gonna happen happened to you, like yes. literally just like years prior. So it's crazy. Yeah, I was literally there working for one company and then the next year was like yeah. with another company. And then the next year I was with Tascam. And then okay. what, uh, what did Tascam want? We had had this, it's just the other day someone posted it and then I reposted it. it they had this thing that was almost con- like, it was like phase. Um, okay. It like went on. Tascam did? Really? Yeah, Not also, really? I have it on my Instagram now. I never used it at home because I had had fun. Okay. But it like attached. It was like this little thing that like attached. You I remember that. I totally yeah. remember that. That's like the thing that Dub had for um, the Rain One, where he would attach yeah. it so he could play uh, Seven Inch Finals. Like- it looked exactly like that. It was like some monstrous machine that would go on the the turntables for that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so then, yeah, it was like, and then the next year I was there for Pioneer, you know, and then it was like. I've pretty much been a pioneer since. Um, haven't performed every year for them, but I pretty much been with pioneer since since then. So okay. I through a bunch, and then there was another company called PC DJ. I worked for them for a little while. I remember that. I did, yeah. Um, well, we're jumping around in the story. I'm sorry that uh, we're, okay. we're making it crazy, but I wanted a little bit of like preference into you getting with Quick. So. Now you're with Quick and you're running this delay that you have no idea what it is. Are you just like, so on the tour bus or when you guys are traveling is when you're just fucking with it and, and learning how this does? Or after every show, does he be like, hey, can you do this song? Or is there any kind of critiquing? No. He doesn't give, he gives no fucks at all. It's just party uh, and then. He gives no fucks at all, but he gave a lot of fucks, but expects yeah. me to just kind of like know, know what to do. So yeah. it was like, it was really tough. It was a lot of work. I was really stressed out. Um, and I would say um, there was a couple times where he like called me out on stage and <laughs> talked shit about me and was like, my DJ sucks, but I also, I didn't know what I was doing. You know what I mean? Right, like, right, right, right. Using the instant replay machine, I was literally learning it on the fly. And it was like, they wouldn't let me plug the instant replay machine like into a mixer, like a DJ mixer. Right. So I had it separately through the DI box. In order to turn the volume down on an instant replay machine, there's no volume knob. Back then there wasn't. So you would have to go into like settings, volume, then turn like the volume down or up. And none of his songs were mastered at the same level. So one song would come in really quiet. One would come in really loud. And he'd be like, come on, DJ, turn the music up or turn it down. By the time, you know, three seconds feels like a year. for like Oh, a yeah. Time. I mean, so it's like. I'm getting there and I'm turning it up and he's going, come on, DJ, come on, DJ, you know, and then you're like, you know, he's sweating and getting nervous. And why would they let you plug it into the mixer? It, the sound techs. Wow. Try being a female back then and telling a sound tech what to do. Right. It was not happening. Yeah. They would not hear me. You can't, you can't even tell them now, right? They're like, no, nah, you're a fucking clown. Get out of here, DJ. Yeah, like, especially back then, like even worse. Like they were just like, no, you don't know anything. Yeah, well, I feel like I'm getting, <laughs> I'm getting arguments with them now still to this day. But, yes, yeah, so that's terrible. I can't even I, imagine. I couldn't even tell you how many times, too, with, like, Sovereign and stuff when they would they would plug in my Serato box wrong. And I'd be like, bro, let me just do it. Just let yeah. me plug in the Serato box. Like, yeah. no, 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 I got this. And I'm like, you don't know what you're doing. <laughs> it's color-coded. What the fuck? Plug it into the <laughs> – Right. But yeah, I'm years and years of that <laughs> i'm so glad the serato box days are over in a lot of ways because god dang that was annoying and the switch over when there was no second usb and you would have to like have a cdj and play a song or like sometimes <laughs> a yeah. place a place with like nothing and then you would have to like do the whole like loop trick on the 900 and then unplug your oh my god yeah and the loop trick like never works only like a handful of djs really could pull the loop trick off <laughs> and it would just sound like a nightmare like and you're like oh my god get something on right now like get something yeah. on right now like it would sound so you're better off just cutting the sound off and having somebody yell right like, <laughs> yeah. you didn't have a microphone 
like, so so how long were you with Quick for at this? I had only done like the summer. It was like one month. It was a one month tour. Oh, um, okay. Yeah, it wasn't. Right. It wasn't super long. And then the day I finished tour with him, I flew to New York City to go see Lady Sovereign, DJ or just perform, and her show was sold out. So and she was huge at the time. You know, she had had like you know a pretty big hit and. A friend of mine was like, hey, my friend is throwing this after party with her, um, you know, if you want to go. So we went to the after party and that's where I got to meet her. And then like I literally just walked. I was so drunk. It was my birthday also. <laughs> and I just finished this tour. Not to mention through the quick tour, I got to be on Jimmy Kimmel. Um, uh, oh, how was that? <laughs> random and wild because it was um, quick was supposed to perform Fandango with cypress hill and travis barker on the drums and then wow. something happened and he ended up getting arrested and he wasn't there like he had had some court or something and we all <laughs> showed up with the 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 tour manager never told anybody not to show up to jimmy kimmel so everybody was there from like security guards to like like all of us were there yeah um you know all these hype guys were there everybody so we're sitting there just kind of like you know, waiting, like what's going on. And then all of a sudden they were like, I don't think Quick's going to show up. So Be Real had his homeboy bring his instant replay machine down to the Kindle <laughs> Studios. And then we just ended up performing. Um, we did Kill a Man and Insane in the Brain. And then they were like, hey. oh, we're going to use you to DJ though. So I was like, all right. Because he had so them. But his DJ was super chill. He was just like, nah, you DJ. <laughs> <laughs> That's so That's tight. crazy. Yeah. And so, and so, wait, wait. You're, you DJed, but then Travis Barker also was playing on top of the replay machine? Yeah, he was playing the drums live. I have it on my yeah. Instagram. It's one of my like saved videos. Uh, you can see wow. it. Oh, watch yeah, it. I'm gonna so have he, to check it out. He had yeah. no idea. Travis Barker, they just flipped it. And Travis, I mean, I guess it's, not, it's just a loop, but still, that's, that's dope. Yeah. They did that and they did Kill a Man. I wish I could find the Kill a Man one because that one was really good too. But, um, I wonder if it's on YouTube somewhere. It's got to be. It's yeah. got to I, I, I randomly went as a guest to Kimmel uh, in those early days. And he was, it was right, right after the man show. So he was just all about drinking beer, right? And so <laughs> everyone would get lit backstage because they would have like an open bar. And then you would go into the crowd and it was the crowd was always pretty wide, uh, rowdy back then. Yeah. The crowd was still rowdy then because it was still a fairly new show, I remember. And people were yeah. like pretty fucking drunk in the audience. I remember that. Yeah. Yeah. I remember having a couple cocktails and being like, this is so much fun. Like, <laughs> like this whole room to myself, too. Like, I was like, this is wild because none of all the quick, like, everybody from the quick camp, like, left. So they yeah. left me with like everything. And I had this giant green room with like everything in there. So I was just like, this is dope. Like, everybody had like, you know, stage outfits to like, change into and i didn't have any of that like i was just there ready to perform and i was like i guess i'll just wear what i'm wearing and and all that because like, i didn't even know at the time what we were doing or what was going to even go on and um, right it was wild so moving back getting back you on your like birthday you went to an after party with the lady sovereign and that's is that how you guys connected yeah so we had met and then um is, was, has she already like blown up or she's still kind of underground at this point? Yeah, she was she and she was on tour with the streets at the time, and that's when they were really big. Yeah. Um but yeah, this whole like after hours was like sold out, lying down the street, like pretty crazy. And I met her and then I'd met her DJ as well. And I was like telling him that I was like a scratch DJ and turntablist and all that. And um I literally just jumped on stage and kind of pushed him off and just like started scratching. <laughs> <laughs> Never said no. Obviously, I was I was young. <laughs> so you talked to him early, and then you're just like, Man, "Fuck this guy, he's whack," and then just jumped yeah, I just and went on stage and started scratching. And <laughs> was he playing something? Or was he just doing a set? Or <laughs> so she had just finished performing, and he was okay. just kind of DJing afterwards, like just kind yeah. of DJing in the club. And I just ran up there, and he was like scratching. So then I. uh I literally just started, um, I just started scratching on like his setup. And then the Def Jam people came up to me and they were like, who are you? We need you for like this next tour. And uh, yeah, 
and that's that's how it all started. That's, that's great. wild. And then, how long were you on tour with her? So I was off and on touring from like 07 to 2010. So that yeah. year, because she, she had had a DJ and she like grew up with him, and you know they like came up together. So she she wanted to keep her loyalty to him, but Def Jam wanted me. So it was like a battle between kind of like that. And then um, what ended up happening was that New Year's, I'm dating myself right now so hard. <laughs> that New Year's, her DJ got stuck in the UK and he couldn't make it. So they called me and they were like, can you make it down to TRL to DJ New oh, Year's wow. TRL? So I got to do that, which was pretty cool. That's amazing. Uh, and any cool stories off of that? I mean, I mean, I'm in mean, Times Square. I'm in Times Square, like, you know, drinking on the MTV, like, balcony, looking at everybody in Times Square, partying, watching, literally physically watching the ball drop, like, all that kind of stuff. Like, it was, it was just nuts. It was nuts. And it was, again, one of those, like, last minute kind of things. Yeah. So being available and that that view is crazy there. I it's something I've always wanted to do. I think I'm too old now to actually go sit in the crowd and too it'd be too cold as well. But having that view and be able to perform and do the whole bit, that's that's nuts. That's so very cool. Yeah, we were literally just like walking around with bottles of champagne. Like it was it was insane. Just like <laughs> who else performed that year? I remember Sierra was the host. I don't even know who else performed. I just remember she performed. Um, I think they were kind of going back and forth between like the outside stage and inside and we were inside. Okay. But I have that video somewhere too. I don't even know where. But, um, you, need to, you need to put all these on your website. I know. One of these Great days. material. They, it's, it, but it's all saved on that, that little camera that you're talking about for earlier. <laughs> Absolute <laughs> shit. Setting <laughs> zero. Look like. All, all of this TRL, like it's all on like a, a an SD card somewhere on there. Yeah, and it's it's the quality is just awful. So I, I found one of those. Uh, do you remember those? Like it looked like an iPad or an iPod, and it had like a USB that like flicked out of it, and it was a camera you could like stick it into your computer. I found one of those the other day that I had like some video footage on from like one of my first gigs, and all you heard was like. <laughs> And then, like, that's all you could, like, really tell. But yeah. it was, like, a flip cam. Some kind of flip cam. I forget what it was called. But I found one of those. Pretty funny. The, the, to see where, like, that technology is gone. I mean, you could just do it all with your phone now. Even, right. Like. Right. Well, we, we're, we've jumped around. I wanted to do the travel artist. We'll, we'll come back to that. But I wanted to just finish up with the brand stuff. So you end up working with Pioneer. And that's carried you along. Um, and now you do, you know, um, you test some of the products before they come out. So you tested the, the Cross 12. I helped design the Cross 12. You helped design the Cross 12. Wow. <laughs> Impressive. Um, and what goes into something like that? You're just, they send you uh, some kind of demo piece and you're like, exactly like what goes into that? Or do you have to go to a private studio where they lock you in a room with take, take away all your shit, your, your little pocket camera, they take away that and they get, take away everything else. Yes. They just locked me in a dungeon and they were just like, <laughs> say a fucking word. Um, yeah. no, it's, it's a whole lot of process. I don't know. NDA wise, what I'm allowed to discuss. So right, like, of course, no, I understand that. It's a it's a whole process of seeing things from the ground up and yeah. getting to make calls on what you like and what you don't like. And you know, I know I'm not the end all be all. So there, I know that there's like other people, but it's just kind of like they, I'm sure they just get like a a bunch of different artists, DJs, and you know, um, tech heads, just kind of like giving them like their opinions, and then they probably just go from there. Right. I mean, again, I know we'll tread lightly on whatever you could discuss, but like, I know they have those buttons on there. So did it come originally? And you're like, yeah, it'd be cool to have like some cue point stuff or I don't know how that, that goes. Yeah. Is that something so, like yeah, that? Something like, that. <laughs> like, yeah. I think Fuse is already getting uh cease and desist for Pioneer right this second. Like to, to stop talking about it. <laughs> I, I would love to know more. I, I, I love the, the, the turntables. I think they're really cool. I can tell you got a, a set sitting right behind you, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They're so good. Now that they're out, though, what's your favorite part about them? Yeah. It, 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 since that 
this is the future. What can you talk about? Your favorite part about how it actually came out. Uh, I would say what I like the most on them is that you can adjust the torque, which I didn't think I'd actually really care about, you know, before. And now mm -hmm. it's, you can like literally adjust how like tight or, you know, like heavy you want the, the record to feel when you're like DJing. So like for scratching, you can get it where it's literally like butter. And I thought I always liked like a higher torque. Right. But now I can adjust it and have like a, a like a looser one. I'm like, this is absolutely fucking insane. So that's probably my favorite part of it. Is, is it hard to go to text after you play on these at home? I wouldn't say it's it's harder, but it's, uh, you know, it takes a few minutes for me to like adjust again. Right. But I'm on text, you know, because most venues have, I'm on text still more than I'm like at home on right. these, you know what I mean? Right. Did you but, also yeah. get to work on the, the Rev 7 or? I did. I worked a little okay. bit on that one. Yep, and the Rev 5, the Rev 1. Wow. And I did the, a little bit on the S11. That was like, okay. kind of, yeah. Do you enjoy playing on the Rev 7s versus uh, like turntables? Do you have like a preference um, anymore? I, for me personally, like anymore, I don't care if there's a Rev 7 or if there's turntables and an S11. Like I don't care anymore. I don't care either. I yeah. did a couple, uh, what do you call it, like movie premieres recently. And they were like, <laughs> the company that hired me were like, what do you, you know, do you want techniques in a, in a S11? And I was like, I'll take a Rev 7. <laughs> like I was, and they were like, really? And I was like, yeah, dude, it's so dope. It's just like playing on turntables. tables. Like, That's to how me, I, feel. I feel the same way. I feel it's yeah. and exactly then I just, the same. Okay, dude, I don't have to charge my face. I don't have to do anything. I'm like, right. this is so easy. It, to right, me, yeah. it was just like turntables. Like it is, it's gotta be the dopest piece of gear I've gotten in my entire DJ career. You know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. And easiest to set up. All I have to do is plug in the power cord and plug in my USB. The, the one, the one thing I'll say uh, where I'll disagree with both of you guys on gear. I like both of the options that you list and fuse, but I have been on like a Nexus 2000, or like not having any cue points, or you know having CDJs and the the 2000 mixer. And I'm just frustrated to not have stems anywhere. I'm I've I've slowly started like loving stems. Obsessed with stems. I can't. I feel like I can't DJ without them now. I'm so right. used to it. And so I'll go to like a venue and it doesn't have that. I have the CDJs and I'm like, I, I feel limited on that. So I I do feel like I at least need to have some sort of pads versus like you know that that old school style club mixer. Yeah, I can't do the old school stuff. Yeah. I would run. I'll take a Rev Seven all day over CDJs and whatever Nexus mixer. I guess. Right. Uh, and I had done a cruise last year. I DJed for Virgin. And that's all they had was like a 900 and CDJs. And um, right. I went and bought, what are they called? Hold on. Let me look. <laughs> I forgot the name of it. Uh, the SP1. Oh, yeah. I went and bought, like rebought an SP1 because I had had one in like, what, probably 2015. And then yeah. I sold it when I got my S9. Right. You, know, you didn't need it anymore. Yeah. And then, uh, I bought one before the cruise because I was like, I'm going to be on CDJs for an entire month doing three sets a day on a cruise ship. I was like, no, nah, I'm going to need some some buttons there, some pads. Yeah. I, I'm i sorry to sidetrack this again, but uh, I, what's it like touring on a, uh, on a cruise ship? Because I'm thinking like as I retire, not retire, but as I get older, that might be like a move where I'm like just become <laughs> like a, 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 a cruise guy. <laughs> it's like a carny, right? Like you're just like, yeah. I don't know. It just sounds interesting to me. I mean – I don't really know. So I've done like, I've done three cruises now. Uh, the first two I did were just like really good paying. Corporate. Well, Virgin has to be dope though. I mean, they're, they're probably oh. Oh, the more cutting in. edge. Oh, okay. <laughs> so the other two I got booked for were like these corporate ones where like, they're only like seven days and they rent these like smaller ocean liners. They fit like 350 people. It's sweets. Like you have a hot tub in your room. These like bougie little like corporate events, pay really good, good time easy so then i was like well fuck it i got offered this cruise for virgin and i saw like you know the, the the money was pretty good on top of it and um i was just like well fuck it but it was 28 days so it was a long time which is actually yeah. a shorter contract than a lot of them so, so some of the other cruise lines i've heard like they make you sign like two or three months i've which heard that a, too which is a long time to be on a ship um yeah, yeah. And uh, so Virgin was literally like, it's adults only. I think it's the only adults only cruise line that, that I'm aware of. 
and it's literally Vegas on a ship. It's just, everybody's just ready to just turn up and gamble and party and do all those kind of things. <laughs> so there's no rules like uh, a carnival cruise. Like you, you could, do they still want you playing clean music? Do you play whatever the fuck you want? Like what are uh, your sets? Yeah. I mean, obviously you use your discretion. Like don't get, you know, too ratchet or too, right, like, right. whatever. Like, you know what I mean? Like use your discretion, but yeah, you can play some F bombs here and there, but yeah. I wouldn't be too crazy with it. You know what I mean? Right. Uh, but yeah, you could play like twerking music and have girls on stage twerking, which I don't think Carnival would probably allow or any of the other ones, you know, cause they're corporate. Right. We definitely had like a lot of stuff like that. It was, it was pretty lit. It was pretty lit. And like the, the food on board was pretty good. It's like for foodies. So it's not like typical other cruises where it's just like buffets. Is, is Virgin still, I mean, they just opened a hotel in Vegas, so they have to still have these cruise ships or did they, I know they sold off all their airlines. They sold off all their airlines, right? Uh, or most of them so that they could open the, the, that casino. I don't know. Yeah. I'm not sure with the cruise ships, but they know they, they still have them. They have one in Australia right now. I literally am getting a call once a day because they're like, they're looking for DJs. So everybody's like, oh, you did this last year. What did you think? You know, so I just, but my phone has been blowing up for like the last two months. Of people <laughs> me, asking me like, you know, would you recommend it and this and that. And I, I've never done any of the like Carnival or Royal Caribbean, but from what I hear, it's, it's less work on Virgin, but it's still a lot of work. Like you're still working every single day, you know? Right. And I get like one day off every like seven days. So it's like, you're still working every single day. They're long shifts? No, they're like, it's just split up through the day. So like one shift will be like an hour and a half. Then you'll have like, you know, four or five hours off. And then you have another shift that's like two hours. Then you'll have like another shift that's like three or four hours. So instead of just like knocking out a five hour pool set, you're like playing for a little, chilling for a bit, playing for a little. So it's kind of like you're up and down all day, you know? That's kind of a lot too, like to shift yes. your like, oh, maybe I'm doing this for this hour and a half, but then I got to get into this mindset to do this. Right. So you're not like fully relaxing in between, you know what I mean? Because you know, you're like prepping and stuff for like your next set and right. Listen, there could be worse gigs, but <laughs> right, right. Yeah, like, I'm it's not, still a lot of work. Yeah, yeah. It is a lot of work. It wasn't like I was just on a cruise ship with like a glass of champagne while and out. You know what I mean? Right. Like, I was definitely. Right, right. You're definitely working, you know, and the yeah. crowd definitely makes you work. So it was, it was good. It was a good learning experience for sure. Yeah. 24 hour drinking. I, I'm sure the crowd's definitely making you work. Yes. <laughs> Those are the drunks. Yes. <laughs> I want to continue on this travel DJ talk. Um, uh, just, I know we kind of skipped over it. We jumped around, but what it's like being a DJ and traveling with an artist. And I'm sure, you know, obviously with the, the different uh, level an artist is so quick might be a little bit higher. Lady Sovereign might be, you know, just like how that works out bus wise. Yeah. I mean, you know, back, back when I was, I can't even say back that just, yeah. Traveling. It's just, you know, you learn all the hacks, all the hacks, yeah. even, Sometimes you have to wash your laundry in the sink. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Like, or, you know, you just buy new stuff. Like, you know what I mean? Right. Just, you kind of learn a lot as you go just because you're, you're nonstop, you know? Yeah. Right. And and you're getting like a per diem uh, a day to day or is like a weekly or how does that work? Per diem daily. And then on days off, you get a day off fee. So they yeah. have to pay like X amount on your days off. Or some people just do a all inclusive, like, hey, well, we'll give you this much for the month, you know. So mm -hmm. it kind of just depends what tour you're doing, you know. Mm -hmm. Okay. Working with. And like those all those days off, the the whole days off ones. Do you get to actually plan what you're gonna do, or it's just like, fuck it, I'm finally off. Like, let's just see where it goes. It depends. I think it all just depends what city you're in, you know. Yeah. Um, but yeah, pretty much just do whatever I want to do. It's kind of funny, like those day offs, like nobody sees anybody from like the tour bus, you know, <laughs> like everybody just kind of does their own thing and they're kind of like, I'm going to take a break on you for today. <laughs> right. Yeah. And were you guys, were you, were you mostly on a bus or were you flying or both? And with, with quick, it was on a bus. Um, and we just did like a lot of West coast stuff, but with sovereign, it was, we did both. We did a bus for a U.S. tour and then 
we did um, for like UK tour or just all over Europe, we flew. And then Australia, we flew. We did like a big tour in Australia. In Germany, I think we did. We flew everywhere. Yeah. What a you guys did a lot. That's a lot of touring. Yeah. <laughs> and with, with Quick was the headliner, was Sovereign, was she opening for someone? Was she headlining a lot of these shows? So the U.S. tour, she was the headliner. And then all, majority of the stuff we did in Europe, she was doing a lot of the really big festivals. So we were doing like Leeds and Reading and like those giant festivals. Right. That Coachella is like based off of now. You know what I mean? Right. So um, we were doing like, you know, with like playing with like Radiohead and like giant acts and Kanye and you know what I mean? You get right. VI. Obviously, you get VIP for everything. Can you? Yes. Um, can you actually get on stage for those, or how limited is that VIP? Like, could you be like, "Oh, I want to go see Radiohead backstage and be off to the side," or you have to it be on the that? artist? It depends because, like, we did one show in Germany with uh, Pharrell and Nerd, and he let us right on stage. Like, he didn't care. But I know a lot of some artists don't want anybody near like the stage. I'd say one of the coolest ones I saw was I got to see Basement Jacks live. Oh, and like, very cool. Yeah, because like you know, like just 90s rave stuff back in the day. It's like, you know, all these other artists, you're like, yeah, I can see you, but to see something so cool like that and all the artists that they brought out. Yeah. That one was really cool. Radiohead too was really good. Um, yeah. What's uh like a big show that stands out to you? Like, or like a big memory from, from those like playing? I would say we did this massive festival in um, Australia and uh, it was basically like, again, like a, it was like a traveling Coachella show. It was called, um, uh, what was the name of it? Park Life. Okay. It was like indie rock bands. So it was like Metric and like, um, oh God, LaRue. And okay. that was, oh. and she, she was like, she had like the number one song, but when they booked her for the tour, she was just, you know, just an artist. Right. So, yeah. <laughs> I know she wasn't super happy that she was just playing like a whatever set. <laughs> I remember like hearing a lot of talk about that. Like she was like, I should be headlining. <laughs> Yeah, I would say just that whole Australia tour was just like absolutely insane. Like that one yeah. was crazy. Who was headlining that? Uh, Empire of the Sun. Oh, okay. Well, they're still in that genre. I still say that. Uh, the Rapture was on another stage. I think they just had a, a show here locally where it, it was uh, similar bands. I think Larue and Empire of the Sun, and and I think Empire of the Sun headlined that. Yeah, and uh, A Trap was on the other stage headlining. Okay. It was just a really dope tour. But then I think too, we did a bunch of stuff. She had switched from Def, Def Jam to another label and it was out of Sweden. So we were literally in like Sweden and Denmark. Like, and I'd say one of the coolest things we did was we, we, uh, we DJ or I, you know, we performed and it was like that time of year where the sun doesn't set. <laughs> so right. it was like seven o'clock at night or, or what? Like 11 o'clock at night and it was still like a light out. And it was just, it was not to me, it was just wild. Right, like, that, like being outside too. Like with Quick, you're doing the the replay machine with her. What does your your setup look like, and what are you, uh, you know, what's kind of your job on for Lady Sovereign versus Quick? So we had similar to an instant replay machine. We had we had I, I don't know the name of it though. It was some little cheap sampler thing. Um, same thing. I just press the songs, and then um, you know I could add in scratches where I wanted to. And then um, I would DJ for like 15 to 20 minutes before she came on and just kind of get the crowd hype. But it was sim yeah. very similar in that sense. But I can play my own effects like from Serato and stuff like that. Because with the instant replay machine, you can only play whatever is playing at that time. Like I can't add in like, you know, explosions and all that stuff. That's got to come from my laptop, you know. Right. You hit another button on the instant replay machine that turns the song off, which I learned on stage and wasn't fun. <laughs> add, like add add some like noises in the background so i did and then it turned the song off and i was like oops <laughs> oh boy yeah that would be I, mean, I, never touched, I had never touched one of those machines before so i had no idea what i was doing you know right right, right. yes yeah, so i learned i learned a lot on the road i learned a lot on that tour i bet any travel hacks? Yeah. Any, any tips for people that are traveling a lot that you you've learned over the years? I don't know. I always like to just book the flight right after we finish the show so that I don't pass out and miss my flight the next morning. <laughs> that makes sense. I understand yeah. that. 
take that that 6 a.m flight or 5 a.m flight just to get just to make sure right from the club yeah. that, you know mm -hmm. same we'll do the exact so same yeah. One of the questions I wanted to ask while we're talking about traveling a little bit still was just uh, holding a residency in Shanghai. Like when was that and how long did you do that for? So I did that for three years. Um, and what they would do is they would fly me out to Shanghai um, and I'd be out there for five weeks. Mm -hmm. They had an apartment out there and all that kind of stuff. And then I would DJ twice a week at their like local club, um, which was just bananas because the way it works over there is you just pay like one fee to get in and then you get unlimited drinks. So everybody was drunk. Like everybody was just like wasted. <laughs> like wow. you could just go up and get a bottle too. be like, I want a bottle. And they're like, okay, what mixer do you want? Mm -hmm. And then they put it in like one little jug and then you could just walk around and drink that all night. It was pretty litty. That's wild. That's yeah. crazy. Did you feel in your time there? I mean, being there for five weeks at a time, would you do that like once or twice a year or was it, I chose to do it once a year, but I think okay. it was twice a year. That's still, I mean, five weeks is still yeah. a good chunk of time a yeah. year. So do you feel like normal traveling to China? Like, did you, did you? I mean, it was a bit of culture shock for me at that time because I had never left. Like I was just your typical like American. Like I think the right. farthest I had ever been was like Canada, you know, right. like, uh, I grew up in upstate New York. so. Uh, I never really saw much other than in Canada. So like going over there and just seeing like a whole different lifestyle and um, just everything and being around, you know, not seeing like the food that you're used to eating and just everything. Everything was like culture shock for me. But it was also yeah. awesome to, you know, like right. see be there. This is again, this is before iPhones too. So it's like I'm over there without Google Maps. Like right. messing. I'm guessing that I'm going the right way, you know? And do you have any friends that you're, you're bouncing around with or like you like your days off or you just get lost? Uh, the, for Shanghai, I was allowed to bring um, an MC with me. So I brought my cousin. Okay. So that was cool. Cause then I at least like had somebody with me there. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is cool. Um, did you, uh, would you do it again? Like if you had to do it now, would you do it again? Um, if I could take off my residencies, yeah, I would do it. It's been so long. I think I, I don't know. A month seems like a long time because even a month right. on the is long. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, if, if if somebody offered me something right now for like a month, I would be like, I don't know about that. Like <laughs> you know. Yeah. I got offered a tour for some movie recently, and it was the same. It was going to be three months, and I was like no way like living yeah. on a tour bus for three months i was like absolutely not <clears throat> but if you were like you know where i was in my career back then you know like you, you have nothing to lose right i miss i miss that stage of like djing where it's like you kind of i i wish that i had that like that that carefreeness now where it's like you could just be like you know yeah i'll go do that for a while well it comes down to like paying rent you know you're, you're it's not just the fee that you're going but it's like i gotta pay all the bills uh, you know back home whereas we probably didn't have bills back then yeah at least I not what they are now it did just did it was like the bill was the rent and that was like the only priority like everything yeah. else didn't matter <laughs> it did. and it was just like an easy yes like of course i'll do it you know yeah, like right you didn't really care like, even if you weren't making a ton of money, you were just, like, happy for, like, the exposure back then, you know? Because there was no, you know, Instagram and stuff where there's, like, influencers where you, like, are competing with or whatever. You know what I mean? Where it's, like, um, content. That would be the word. You don't have to have, like, the con – you know, back then you didn't have to have it. So it was, like, you could just go and take these kind of, like, things because it was just, like, it was keeping you busy at the time, you know? And then it looked like you can come home and flex – you know, right. <laughs> yo, dude, I was just in fucking China. I was just here. I was doing all this, you know. I was just telling Drew this morning, I was like, man, I really, maybe this is a midlife crisis or like, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not in midlife yet. Well, maybe, I don't know. Maybe if I live to 80, I guess I am close to midlife. But uh, I was telling him, I'm like really envious of some people that are just DJs still. And it's like they just wake up and like go DJ and like 
maybe you make some edits here and there, but like, I miss that stage of like my career of like where that was like the really only responsibility. Cause now it's like, I have all this other stuff and it's like yeah. some days it's just overwhelming. Yeah. I think about that when I watch, like, especially like DJ E's, you know, one of my really good friends and he is just every day in a different city, still traveling like that. And then he'll, he'll go back home for like two or three days. And then he's just right back out there. And it's like, you know, Tampa, Miami, fucking Nashville one, week, you know, then he'll go home for two, three days and then out again. And like, I did that for so many years that I, I don't know if I could, ha my body could handle that again, <laughs> you know? It's a back, lot. Yeah. But back then it was just, that, that was just what you did. Yeah. It was just what you did. Like you just traveled and you played clubs and that's, that's like what, what you did. Um, I think about it all the time too, with just like musicians and like anybody that just like, like when you get used to like doing one thing and you've done it your whole life, it's like, you don't know anything else that it just becomes normal to you. Yeah. You know, and if I didn't get residencies, like after I finished the Lady Sovereign tour, it was the last one we did was like nine months hard touring. Like I was back and forth. I was living in Chicago at the time. And it was sometimes it would be cheaper for them to fly me back to Chicago than to pay me day off fee and keep me in, in London. So I would literally fly back, you know, like nine hour flight back to Chicago. I'd be home for like a day and a half and then they'd fly me back. Wow. It made no sense, but that's what they would do. And my body was just like, I was so exhausted after the end. It's like that. Too. Right. You know, yeah, that that would suck. <laughs> that flight. They were like Europe flights. They weren't like, you know, four hours to Florida. Right. <laughs> right. Right. It was like long flights. So by the end of that tour in like 2010, like I was pretty, I was pretty burnt out. Um, and then I just got residencies and did like the residency thing for like I don't know, six, seven years. And then when I moved out to LA, I was kind of struggling to get some gigs here. So I started touring again. And so I did it again for like a few years from like 2017 to like probably 2020. I was just still like on the road. Like I'd go out for like three weeks and just like, you know, do a week of gigs like in the South and then fly home and then do, you know, another week of gigs somewhere else. Or I would just stay out, you know, and just go do, a, a, you know, two weeks of gigs in Toronto. Just keep that, you know, money coming in. Cause that's what I knew. That's what I knew. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, and then I realized, like, if you're not in L.A., you won't get booked here. <laughs> like, you have to be here. Yeah. People forget about you here. Like, they, you know. Yeah. So I was like, yeah, I don't, like, really stay here. <laughs> Before we, we move off uh, traveling, DJ, um, <clears throat> we always get different guests on every episode. And I don't think we've really had, like, a, a DJ for an artist. And I just want maybe any anybody that's curious into doing that. Uh, you know, uh, in, into maybe that field. Like, because I, I'm always fascinated by how many different routes a DJ could choose. You know, it isn't just being a club DJ or a wedding DJ. There's tons of different routes. So is that something you'd recommend for someone? Is it uh, something you wouldn't recommend for somebody? Um, and maybe like a tip if they did want to do it. I think it just depends your level of DJing and like where you're at and like where your, your hunger is. You know what I mean? Because it's like, it's, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of touring. If you're like up for it and your schedule like works with it, then I would, I say go for it because it's an experience. You get to travel the world for free on someone else's dollar, you know? So, yeah. it's, so I, I, of course I would say go for it, especially if your schedule permits. Right. Um, and, and level wise, what, what, uh, this year, <clears throat> what's needed for like a, a tour DJ? You need to be able to scratch. You need to be able to run the programs. Like what, what do you think is needed? Skill yeah. wise. I don't even know if you need to scratch anymore. I think back in the day that was like a thing, but now it's like, I think you just, it's like more of like, you know, a look, I think now versus like back then it was like about having like a really dope, you know, DJ that could scratch or juggle or do something like that. But I think it, it all depends on the artist too. Like I was just watching Justin Timberlake's DJ and like, they got a cool thing going on. I don't know if you saw that guy. Mm -hmm. Did you guys see any of it? Mm -mm. So cool. I, I don't can't remember what his DJ name is, something Hypes, Andrew Hypes or something like that. And he's got like a whole back and forth with Justin Timberlake going on. It's pretty cool. And like, he's like, Look it up. and then, yeah, it was really, really dope. That is cool. I also think that like, it depends on the artist and like the artists, the stage of the artist career, like somebody like that, like a Justin Timberlake, who's like, I want to do something cool with 
like and then cer certain artists are probably like i don't give a shit it's about me and like we're gonna do my songs and like you know so yeah. i think there's probably a lot that plays into that kind of stuff it definitely definitely depends on the artist like yeah some artists want like that interactive like you know stage kind of stuff with like their you know whether it's a band or it's a dj or dancers and some artists don't you know and aren't about that at all they're like it's my show you know right. so I think it just depends because I've heard some nightmare stories from some friends that have worked with artists. So I, I literally think it just depends on who you're working for and what you're doing. Because I, I also know too, like a lot of DJs that have taken on artists uh, to be an artist DJ. And then at the end of it, there's no pay for them. Uh. You know, I think it also depends to like, make sure you're working with an artist, you know, is established enough that isn't going to shortchange you on the end, you know? Mm -hmm. you know you take it as like a you know a write-off and you chalk it up to experience you know but yeah i think just seeking an artist that you you vibe with too yeah you're on you're spending a lot of time together <laughs> yeah so you want to get somebody that you you know you vibe with because I've, I've even like done like certain sets where i've like just run tracks for some artists too and they'll just show up and they'll just look at you and be like you ready dj and i'm like ready for what you didn't give me any music like ready for what like right. you know they're like, oh, download my songs. I'm like, from where? Yeah. And we go on in like 10 minutes. Like, from where? From what? Yeah. <laughs> you know? Like, right. I've definitely gotten like that kind of side of it, too. Yeah. Uh, one of the things that we always do is um, a crazy DJ story. And I feel like we've gotten a lot of crazy DJ stories <laughs> for you, but from you already. But if you, if, if you want to tell one more, we'll play this segment and then we'll, we'll get into it. <laughs> All right, there's our crazy DJ segment, which makes me cringe every time I watch it. <laughs> uh, so this one wasn't me particularly, but I was on stage while it happened. And uh, so Lady Sovereign was like getting ready to go stage dive. And some other kid jumped up on stage. And then he, you know, pointed to the crowd like where he was going to jump. This was in Brooklyn, so I'll never forget it. It's on YouTube too. He pointed to where he was going to jump and the entire crowd just moved and he fell completely on his face. <laughs> it's like a movie. <laughs> it was. It looked like he got swallowed in the crowd. Like, oh, wow. that one was just like wild. Oh, it was pretty crazy. I, <laughs> I, oh man. I've never seen anybody split like that before. And the funniest thing too was there was this guy, Hollywood Holt. He was like this like, Chicago rapper and he had stage dive before too and everybody carried him no problem but then when the random kid from like the crowd jumped up there they were just like and, and did, so did, did Lady Sovereign decide not to go or did she like show him up and no, then, she uh, started screaming on the microphone and like, <laughs> everybody was like laughing like and like oh my god what did we just see that is crazy <laughs> oh that's like Wild. uh yeah I don't know about that I see even people at like you know, when you go to like concerts and stuff, people doing it and how it's like more common now. And they always have like security guys up front that are like helping people get down. That's like my biggest fear would be like getting dropped at like, yeah. I don't know. I shouldn't say biggest fear. That's like, <laughs> but I, I don't think I would want to do that. Back back in the days when we go to punk shows, we yeah. would any any uh, anyone that was floating, we'd take their shoes off and throw it at the stage. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I'm like I'm like quit floating, you're just kicking me in the head and just pissing me off. So I'm like, fuck your shoes then. Definitely did dumb shit like that when I was a kid, but not yeah. not as an adult. I would ever do that, especially yeah. after watching that ha happen live. You know when that kid. That. Did he get up and shake it off, or <laughs> just a, yeah, that was just yeah? You know, he kind of gave some like yeah. and it's stuff. just like in Wayne's World where Stacy hits the car and she gets yeah. up and <laughs> she's okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that was. I mean, I know that I've got like a lot of more like horror stories, so we'll save those for another day. Uh, yeah. so, one of the like craziest things to see. All right. One of the last things that we always do is we, we call it the sauce. 
and uh, we'll play another little video here. But it's uh, any advice you would give to younger DJs? Any advice maybe you would you you would give to your younger self or anything that you would do different? So you can think about it. We'll roll this video and then we'll get started. Hi, the name is Bootsy, baby. And uh, this shout out goes out to Drew and Fuse, all the way from Cincinnati to the LBC bobble. Yeah, I was told you guys are quite the chefs and you got a delicious sauce that you cooked up. Ooh, and it drips that swagoo and breaks down the recipe. Yeah, and you giving up the pee cause it's funky. As in good that is, finger funkin' good. On the one by the power of the one. Yeah, without that, there is none. So get yours and be in tune with the one that loves you. Get it, baby. All right. There it is. Bootsy's asking for the sauce. Uh, I think my, my advice would literally be to just uh, don't take everything so personal. Um, I think that that was something, you know, I stumbled on a lot coming up, but I feel like there was a lot more haters then. I feel like people are nicer now. Um, you know, you're not getting hated on message boards anymore, you know, right. um, but yeah, don't, don't take everything so personal. Try to be present and just try to come from, you know, a good place when you're like out there and you're doing what you're doing. Try not to get too competitive in it. Um, practice as much as you can. Yeah, get to know your library and practice as much as you can. <laughs> I was going to say taking things personal and learning to to not take things personal is is a really hard task. Even you know, I I still tell myself all the time. Sometimes like. You know, even in the middle of the night, people request or somebody's rude to you. It's like, it's not personal. They would have been rude to whoever right. is in that, you know, in that situation. It's a them. It's a them thing, not a you thing. Right. Or even when you have like a, you know, like your manager yelling at you, you got to remember that they're getting yelled at probably by someone else. And you're just right. the only person they can come down on. Mm -hmm. So it's also, again, like learning, like not to take it so personal when you're like, you know, in the thick of it. And so that you don't flip out and embarrass yourself. For sure. As far as the, <clears throat> the practicing wise, uh, I had heard this question come up. <clears throat> one of the crate hackers things, and they were saying, if you practice, is it just going through your library and organizing your crates? Or is it like actually being on the turntables and practicing uh, sets and mixes? I think that depends on like whatever like style of DJ you want to be. You know what I mean? If you're somebody that wants to do like dope word plays and with scratching and all that, then you're going to probably want to be more hands on and practicing on the turntables. But if you're just somebody that wants to have like a clean set and you want to just like know your tunes, then you can just kind of do something like that. Or if you want to be like a dope turntable, it's like you got to actually practice, you know, like I teach uh, a little bit and I have some students who are so amazing. They are so dope. And then they come back like the next week and I'm just like, did you guys practice? And they're like, no. And I'm like, you know how dope you would be if you practice? Like, yeah, you would have surpassed me already. Like, they're so dope. And I'm like, will you just please practice? Like, right. <laughs> yeah, 15 minutes a day. That's what my piano teacher used to say back in the day, and I would never <laughs> practice. So, yeah. How's that working over you now? <laughs> I, I, I wish I wish I would have done <laughs> way more. See, you know what I mean? Yeah. Mm -mm. But yeah, it's. Uh, it's, it's something that's really important, I think, um, you know, to just be doing some something daily, whether it is like organizing your library or, um, you know, practicing, your, you know, your scratching or just getting to know your stuff or practicing playing the keys for 15 minutes because, you know, you're a producer and stuff like that. It's those little things that like just kind of add up, you know? For sure. Yeah. For sure. And it's a lot easier to learn when you're younger than when you when you get older. Yes. <laughs> Shit. So. What else to do? That's why these kids have an hour are so dope. <laughs> it's like you don't have anything else to do except practice. Right. I, I'm just teaching myself now how to unlearn the things that I learned back back in the days. <laughs> it's wild. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's wild. All, all my mistakes, unlearn them. Quite a few because that's just what we had back then. And like even yeah. like, you know, a lot of people hate on 
uh, the DJs that match with like like the uh, matching the waveforms. But I'm like, all them like their ears aren't going to be blown out by the time they're fifty. You know what I mean? Because they're matching by waveforms. Well, right, yeah, right, for sure. Because uh, like I'm still matching by ears, so you know my ears ring. I'm sure the majority of DJs' ears ring. You know, we all got that now. Yeah. You didn't know back then to wear like ear protection. Yeah, wear ear protection. That's another one. I'm good oh, about cool. that now. Mm-hmm. You you wear them every time you DJ. Every time I DJ, bungalow set, really? a corporate set. Yep. Oh. Always, I've got the in ear ones. I wear them, except for when people want to come talk to me. Then I gotta take them out because <laughs> then I can't. Yeah. Hear people. But mm. other than that, yeah, I pretty much always have them in. Good for awesome. you. Good, Good for you. Yeah. Good. Good one. <clears throat> All right. Well, cool. We, you know, I think that's gonna pretty much cover everything for today that we wanted to chat about. Um, before we jump off, will you just tell everybody where they can find you or promote anything you want to promote? Yeah. Uh, Pretty much just Instagram is all I'm really using these days. So it's just analyze, A-N-N-A-L-Y-Z-E. Um, yeah, that's it. Awesome. Well, thank you for taking the time to be on here with us today. We appreciate chatting with you. And yeah. it was fun to talk all the stories. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of great stories. Yeah. <clears throat> thank you. Yeah. I appreciate you being on. Thank you. Appreciate all right. It. Until yeah. next time, we'll talk to you guys later. See ya. Right. Peace. Bye.